My Gavan and Melonine, and well met indeed. I'm Arche Galadirathan, head of the modding team behind Divide and Conquer, and welcome back to another Law Faction Overview. Today we will be discussing the town and the peoples of Bree. I particularly wanted to do Bree today. There's something homely about Bree that I quite like, and I thought uploading this on Christmas Day 2018 would be rather fitting. So let's dive in. We'll start off talking about the people that live in Bree, and then we will discuss briefly the history of the town itself, uh, and then move on to more geographical and topical points before then jumping over to what is different in Divide and Conquer in relation to Bree. So the peoples that inhabit the land of Bree came to Eriador in the Second Age of Middle-earth. So many of you will of course know that humans were present in the First Age and they assisted the Elves in the wars against Melkor, uh, but not every human on the planet had fought in those wars, and many of them remained in Middle-earth, and the peoples of Bria are such. However, they did not found Bri back when humans awoke, um, and the men of Bri are close kin to the Dunlendings and the middlemen of Ened Wythe. Uh, they all share common uh, heritage. So as I say, in the Second Age, Bree is founded by um, peoples coming north from Enidwyth and from Dunland, uh, and they found the town atop a small hill known as Bree Hill, um, which is where the town then takes its name. Um, and of course, the inhabitants of Bree, by the time that we deal with the city, or the town, better to call it a town, are also hobbits. But the hobbits don't arrive for a good long while after men found the town. So at some time in the Second Age, we don't know when Bree is founded. But then jumping considerably further forward, likely at, at least 1,500 years, if not more, um, or certainly more, probably around 2,000, 2,500 years, Bree exists as a simple mannish town. But then, of course, the hobbits on their migration from the east, from starting in the Gladden Fields and then through to Dunland and then on to finally settle in Bree. Um, so hobbits come to live there as well. And by the time of the Third Age, the hobbits and the humans coexist quite happily indeed. But we don't know if there's any troubles in their past whatsoever, um, but they certainly are peaceful and prosperous by the time of the Third Age. So those are the peoples that live in Bree. Now the town itself doesn't really feature in the histories much at all. Even though it lies on a particularly important crossroads between the Great East Road that runs from the Grey Havens all the way through Bree, over the mountains and on then to Dale. Uh, a key journey point specifically for the dwarves but also for any wishing to traverse the lands of Eriador from east west or west to east. Also, of course, in the time of Arnor, or the heyday of the United Kingdom of Arnor and Gondor, um, the town of Bree also played host to the North-South Road, the Great North-South Road, which ran all the way from Fornost Orion south through Tharbad, of course, where there's famously a bridge, and then down through Dunland, Enidwyth, and then on to Gondor through the lands of Rohan, or at that time, Kalanathan. Uh, so Bree's in a very important location, but still barely factors into the histories. Uh, we don't really have any information of what happens to Bree during the wars of Angmar and Arnor. For at the time of those wars, of course, Bree is in the realm of Cardolan, one of the three sub-factions of Arnor after they break away. And um, so its peoples, it can therefore be assumed Bree is devoid of life, at least by the time that Cardolan falls. So we're talking quite late into the Third Age, around the year 1900, for example. Um, at that point, only Arthurdine and Fornos present any more uh, defence against Angmar. But we don't know for certain, you see. Bree may well have existed as some sort of enclave, but it's very unlikely. So it is presumed, therefore, that around 1975 of the Third Age, Bree is abandoned by all of its inhabitants because Cardolan is defeated and Fornost is the final holdout for men in the war against Angmar. But then by the time of the Third Age, Bree, of course, is again settled by hobbits and humans and they live peacefully and coexist nicely. We don't know if Bree contributes to the war against Angmar in any specific way or if it is just simply a named town within the Kingdom of Arnor, which is far more likely. 
So the geography of the town itself then, of course, as I've already mentioned, it's built upon a hill, the Brie Hill, but it doesn't cover the hill entirely. It's built into one side of the hill. And most of the humans within the town live on or at the base of the hill. And then the town is protected rather... <laughs> rather um, Britishly, if you will, for want of a much better word, by a large hedge. And um, there's a hedge and a deep ditch that they use to defend the town against any would-be attackers. And there are two gates within um, within this hedge that, that allow you into the town itself, and they have watch posts on the gates. So it's a very simple town by the Third Age. There's no walls, there's no armed militia, there's no... There's, there's nothing, really. It's a very simple town that at once was a very strong and large economic centre owing to its um, important location. But by the time of the Third Age and the fall of Arnor and the fall of the Great North Road becoming the Greenway and laying mostly abandoned, Bree loses much of its importance. Its only real claim to fame by the Third Age then is that it is the most westerly point or site of Manish civilization in Middle-earth. For of course no men live in Linden and no men live in the Blue Mountains and no men live in the Shire so Bree marks the most westerly point of Manish expansion by the Third Age. But and as small and as short as this section has been I'm afraid that is pretty much everything to say about Bree. We do not know any of the following. Uh, does Bree for example how are they led? What, does it have a, um, a mayor? Is there a mayor of the human side, a mayor of the, of the hobbit side? Uh, do they have any form of militia if, if need be? Of course the Shire is famously invaded in, the, um, in the, the great winter when the white wolves cross into the Shire. And we don't know, is, is Bree affected at that time as well? Do they have to muster men to defend their lands? We just don't really know. Of course, though, Bree does factor into the story of the War of the Ring, where uh, it plays host to um, evil men of the South under Saruman's bidding. Um, and they are there seeking for information and um, getting an idea of what the Shire is, how prone the Shire is to invasion, which ultimately happens, of course. Ruffians, they are called. I've gone with evil men, but they are described as ruffians. And it is, of course, Saruman passes through Bree at some point when he's taken on the name of Sharku and is kicked out of Isengard. He passes through Bree at some point. But again, we would assume he passes through Bree. We have no real concrete information. Um, so it's a place of little information, um, but to describe Bree in a few words, it would be peaceful. It is a very peaceful location, and other than the war with Angmar, has not really seen any death or threat or fear. Um, it's, it's been largely left out of the histories of Middle-earth because it passes by many of the major events. Uh, so it's a very peaceful and... and I want to use the word backward, but that's doing them a disservice. Not everyone has the knowledge and skill that the Numenorians came, uh, brought with them from the West. And of course, Bree wasn't affected by the Numenorians, whereas Gondor, of course, was built at a time of greater um, strength and skill where, of men. Um, so it's it's a little unfair to say that Bree is backward, but it is backward. <laughs> it's uh, but no, peaceful for the fourth time is the word I would use to describe. Ah, but Galu, I hear you cry, is not the faction called Breeland and the Shire? And to thee I say, yes, it is. So before we jump over to the second half and see what Dak has changed to make Bree and the Shire fit in a Total War setting, let's first of all discuss a little of the history of the Shire and the Perianath, which is Sindarin for Hobbits. So, the Shire is settled in the year 1601 of the Third Age, and there are two famous brothers, Marcho and Blanco. They set out from the town of Bree, where the hobbits have been living, segue in, and very important to what we've just spoken of, um, and they head west under the authority of the High King at Fornost, for at the time, 1600, um, the uh, realm of Arnor still exists. The lands that become the Shire used to be nothing more than simple farmlands and king's hunting grounds. Um, so famously the king of Fornost or the king of Arnor before that, the high king of all Arnor and Gondor indeed before that, um, it was simply his hunting ground. So it was a land of farms um, and woodlands. But by the time that the hobbits come there it is entirely abandoned of course because the realm of Arnor is under threat and many of them now live in Arthedain or Fornost or the Northern Reaches, defending against Angmar. 
Um, so, Marchau and Blanco lead many of the Perianeth, as I say, the Sindarin word for hobbits, over across the Baron Duin, which they then subsequently renamed the Brandywine, or rather, um, Hobbitize. I can't think of a Hobbit version of the word Anglicize, but uh, it's called the Baron Duin to almost all who live in Eriad or in the Great River, um, and then the hobbits change it to Brandywine. And they cross over there and they settle in the Shire, as I say, 1601 of the uh, Third Age. Um, the next real event that affects the Shire, though, there, of course, they do, it is said, contribute towards the war against Angmar in that they send a company of stout bowmen to Arthurdine and then Fornos to assist, but there's no real, it, or there's a note somewhere where it says that uh, the humans don't actually ever make mention that the hobbits came to assist them, so it may well be that the hobbits just like to tell everyone that they sent assistance in the war against Angmar, because there's no one left alive to fact check them, so <laughs> they just get away with it. Um, but it, they, obviously, the Shire doesn't fall after Fornos does, so... Um, the Witch King, of course, destroys Fornost in the year 1975 of the Third Age, so 374 years after the Shire is established, Arnor is finally defeated once and for all. But in that same year, the Witch King is then also defeated, and so he doesn't ever get to the Shire in order to cleanse it. So they survive the fall of Arnor, and they survive the Great Plague of 1636, which of course, as many theorised, was sent by the Witch King. And... Um, they are next really under threat considerably later. Um, in the year 2747 is the next time that the Shire, or indeed the Breland, is actually under threat. And that is, of course, the famous battle between Bandabras Took at the Battle of Greenfields, where he defeats an orc band invading from Mount Graham. So they settle in the Shire in 1600, and then 1140 six years later 1400 years later that's a, that's a ridiculous amount of time or 1100 sorry is the next time the shire actually has a threat so they have a thousand years of peace essentially or 700 years of peace if you include the fall of arnold the fell winter that i spoke of with the walls coming down from the north uh, happens in 29 11 of the third age uh, so 1300 years after the settle uh, settling of the shire the Shire itself is then broken into four parts, four farthings. There's north, south, east, and west. There's, in addition to the four farthings, though, there is the Buckland, which is the small piece of land between the Old Forest and the Brandywine River, uh, on the eastern side of the Shire. And also there is West March and East March. But West March, West March is not added um, until a considerable time later, indeed after the um, defeat of Sauron. So the West March, which is the land that runs up to the Tower Hills, is added after Sauron is defeated. Unlike with Bree, where we don't really know what the leader structure is for the town and the, and the people of the land, we do for the Shire. And the Shire is broken down politically into two main roles with a third sort of ancillary role. And that is the Thane of the Shire is the top man in the Shire. Or top man's not really the right word. Um... The Thane of the Shire is tasked with the protection of the Shire, um, but the the arguably the most important hobbit within the Shire is actually the Mayor of Mitchell Delving, which is the largest town within the borders. But together, those two form what could be described as the political scene of the Shire. It's very, very um, bare bones, but, but there it is. In addition, there's also a role of postmaster, um, which is held in quite high esteem, and as you might expect, is just the um, head of the postal service. And those are the three main positions within the Shire. Um, the Thane is also the um, head of the sheriffs, um, which is the kind of police force, um, but they're not really police force. They, they guard the borders and they ensure order and civility, but the Shire doesn't ever have problems with order and civility, so... Um, it's more of a just wander around at night time and make sure everyone's turned their lights off kind of role. But um, So the Thane and the Mayor are the two most important people within, within the Shire. Uh, Peregrine Took is perhaps the most famous Thane um, after Bandabras. Um, and he holds the Thaneship for quite some time. Um, Sam becomes the Mayor of Mitchell Delving as well. and he, I think he's um, if, oh, it's from memory, I apologise, but I'm fairly certain he holds the position for two um, terms, whereas they normally are supposed to only hold it for one. Or um, He's certainly famous for his holding of the, of the Mayor role. But, um, but there we are. 
So the Shire is founded in the year 1601, and then it's invaded by orcs, it's invaded by wolves. Both of these events are beaten back by the hobbits and they thrive economically. It is worth saying, as I as already mentioned, but saying again, no humans live within the Shire and very few even pass through its lands. The dwarves, to name a few, because they often travel between the Blue Mountains and the Lonely Mountain. And of course, elves, when they start leaving Middle-earth, they also pass through. But the Shire and the Hobbits is very much left alone otherwise. For dividing Conquer's changes to Bree, then, um, the first and most important change is that we have elected someone to be a mayor of Bree. Now, in the first half of the video, I did mention that I didn't think Bree had any form of political structure, but I'm assuming, given how much they're based on such a quintessential English town, they must have some form of leadership, a mayor or something. Um, and that is what we have opted for, certainly. Um, we've also chosen Barleyman Butterbeer to be the council master of the faction. So whilst we've decided that Bree does indeed have a mayor, and you'll note that he's called the mayor of Bree, we've also given them something of a council theme, which you'll see is fairly common throughout the Divide and Conquer factions. And, and that is that there is this ruling council, if you will, of merchants that control the fate of Bree. Upon the council as well, though, is also the Thane of the Shire, as mentioned again from the first half. In this game, uh, Paladin currently acts as the Thane of the Shire. So, Bree is ruled over by some elite nobles, or, or not really elite nobles, but probably the wealthiest men of the town. Those who have a direct interest in safety and security on the edges and the borders. And heading up that council is Barleyman Butterbeer. Now, we chose Barleyman Butterbeer purely because he is one of the few named peoples in the town of Bree who does not then go on to try and attack the Shire, so he seemed like an obvious choice. We could have just made someone up, but I always think it's better to try and use names. For the same reason why the General of Hobbiton, you'll note, is Bilbo Baggins, because despite originally not being Bilbo, so many people asked to just have him in because he would be in the Shire at this time that we thought, why not? If the Shire were attacked in the Third Age whilst Bilbo was still there, I would certainly think he would be amongst those who tried to defend it and fight back, being one of the only ones who has actually ever held a weapon and experienced any kind of warfare. So it does stand to reason that Bilbo would try and defend the Shire. And that is, of course, the scenario in Divide and Conquer. We are taking these sleepy peoples who have never really known fear or war, and we are thrusting them into a total war setting. So certain things have to change. Uh, so Barleyman Butterbeer heads up the council and the faction heir is known as the councilman. So the leader of the faction heads the council and the heir is chosen from amongst the um, council's number. But that's really the only significant change we have for Bree. Um, the town itself remains as it is, much uh, built atop a hill. And even the battle map represents the um, map description of Bree. Save for we can't use hedges, obviously, so it has to have a wooden wall. Uh, and of course, the Shire being militarised is another feature with various Shire units, which wouldn't be in the um, in the books in truth. Of course, in the scouring of the Shire, the Hobbits do rise up against the ruffians and do fight back. But um, they're fighting back with just whatever they can get their hands on. They're not organised militia. Uh, they, they are just picking up, some of them fighting with just walking sticks. So, um, And of course their weapon of choice really are ranged weapons because they don't have the strength in melee to beat humans. Um, so they have to kill them before they reach them. So the Shire being militarised is a major detraction from the book. But other than that, Bree stays very much the same. We also then... Focusing on how Bree actually fight in this total war setting, of course, much like the Shire, they wouldn't have an organised military and they don't have any kind of troops, no dedicated warriors. So in our version, this is reflected by in the first sort of 60 turns of the game, um, which is 200 and something years. Um, or oh, no, it's not, sorry, it's 15 years, because it goes the other way. Um, in the first sort of 15 years, they fight with just peasants armed um, with whatever they can find and, and lowly militia. They've got hunters who have come in from the countryside to fight with their bows and lumbermen who have also come in from the forest to fight for them. Uh, and then it's not until you get beyond this kind of military event where Bree decides and or where we have a military event in Divide and Conquer where every nation then is allowed to use its more mainstream forces. And it's this this event for Bree then turns them a little bit more militarised. But the main feature for Bree's military in the game is that you have one of two choices uh, and that is to either going along the theme of the book whereby Aragorn eventually rebuilds the Northern Kingdom of Arnor, you have a choice as Bree to side with the Dúnedain 
and then you get various um, Dunedain visuals for your units and you also get to train a few Dunedain units. So it's kind of an unofficial merger of the Northern Dunedain and Breland to represent the old Arnorian kingdom and indeed the now flourishing and newly created Arnorian kingdom that Aragorn creates in uh, 3019. Uh, but if you, you also have an option focusing on Bree's merchant past to instead eschew the Dunedain in favour of merchants and mercenaries. Uh, so Bree can turn its wealth towards war by training others to do the fighting and more specifically the dying for them so that they don't have to. But in both of those cases you get someone else to do the fighting and dying for you and that's the key point. Bree are not military and if you even if you choose one of the two paths and you don't train any of those units, your units will never be able to beat the nations around you. So it reflects Bree's not um, very <laughs> military past. Um, but that's about it really for Bree, I'm afraid. There's no major detractions, or massive detractions I should say, there are major ones, but there aren't any, um, they're not constant and, and offensive detractions from the book. And they are just twists to make it so that the faction actually can exist in a total war setting. Various geographical locations are obviously condensed for the needs of the map. Um, for example, Arquette, which is a small village on the um, in the Chet Wood, which is just this wood here. Um, it used to actually be a settlement, but unfortunately we, we have a settlement limit, so it, it was taken away in favour of somewhere a little bit more important and useful. Uh, but of course there's things like that, and, in, and indeed the old forest, whilst being mystical and, and um, never really ever entered in in the books, uh, on the battle map or the campaign map for Divide and Conquer, it is simply a forest on the edge of the Barrow Downs. Um, in reference to the Barrow Downs as well, of course, we militarised again the actual Barrowites themselves, which of course never would have happened. People just never went to the Barrow Downs, but if an army were to pass through, I am sure the Barrowites would not try and murder an entire army. There aren't very many of them after all. We've also extended the location of the Barrow Downs a little further across the hills, um, whereas in truth they didn't go beyond Mengelen, I believe, or they are either... They either aren't here or they aren't here. I think it's over here that they're not. They stop with the Greenway. Um, but we've extended them on just so that you can fight in a specific battle map a few more times. Um, you'll note, though, that the Great East-West Road still does exist, um, going at the moment as far east as Amun Sul and then on to um, the rivers outside of Imladris, finally finding the Bruin in just there. Um, I am remiss. I can't remember the name of this river. I apologise. Oh, I've got a map right next to me. Hang on. It's called the Horwell. <laughs> there we are. Uh, and the road eventually getting to Imladris and then through Goblin Town over and then on past the mountains of Mirkwood and out to eventually to Dale, which is the um, where the road would have passed. Although I'm interested to note that obviously the road would have gone over Goblin Town, um, but would large merchant caravans really have gone over the mountains like that? There must have been a better way. I wonder if it went through Khazad-dum instead. Uh, back in day when Khazadum was available. And of course going out to the west it goes through the Shire and then on to the Grey Havens. And the Great North-South Road ends at Dead Man's Dyke, which is the name of Fornost in the Third Age, and uh, heads all the way down, crosses at the Bridge of Tharbad, and then it goes past the Gap of Rohan, uh, through Rohan, and down to Minister. Uh, and so that's very much represented by the road itself being relatively large. In uh, this is There's three tiers of road in the game, and we've given it the third tier. Although do note, of course, that the Greenway is relatively abandoned in the Third Age, so. But uh, we wanted to give the road some importance, and uh, that was the only real way we could do it. So those are the major changes for Bree on the campaign map. I appreciate this uh, video again has been a relatively short one and I assure you that the next one will do a faction that actually has something to talk about. But I just really fancy doing Bree um, at Christmas time. I don't really know why. I think it's because I, um, I really like Bree. After Dol Amroth they are my favourite faction and uh, so I wanted to get them out there. But if you've got any questions or comments, or indeed you wish to tell me that I said something wrong, then please do it constructively and pop it in the comments down below, and I'll read it when I get a chance and uh, respond to those uh, that uh, I can. Uh, but until we speak again, dear friends, Navar Naden Peramat Melonin, and if you indeed celebrate Christmas, then Merry Christmas. Um, and if you just enjoy having a week off work, then um, enjoy having your week off work. Uh, but until we speak again, uh, farewell. <laughs>